Okay. I'm Janet Grimes, your lay leader today. Welcome to this time of sharing and worship. If you're a guest this morning, we're glad that you're here. Please take time to complete the communications and prayer request form in the bulletin. The prayer forms will be collected during service and all prayers will be lifted up today and remembered throughout the week. Join us for refreshments after worship in the East Room. You're welcome to make use of our family worship room, just located outside the sanctuary in the West Ring where the service is broadcast there. Thank you to Piper Woodall for being acolyte, and Kim and Janet Grimes for greets and treats. I don't know. <laughs> Some tall drink of white water back there. All righty. Please review the announcements in your bulletin, just uh, the whole page, actually, and the back side. But all boards, please have your annual reports to Bob Zirko by the 5th. There is a combined joint meeting with the trustees, the Board of Education, and the diaconate on January 8th at 6.30. The annual meeting and youth service is the 11th, and it's Super Sunday for our potluck. There are still some openings on uh, the Diaconet Board, Harvest Home, and Church in the Woods. Please see Bob or Ada. And also in the East Room on the table, there are sheets with a draft of a proposed bylaw change um, brought up by the trustees. So if you'd like to take a chance to read that, we'd appreciate it. Are there any other announcements? Okay, last one before I forget, Women's Retreat. Don't forget there are sheets out there. It's March 7th, and it's going to be a great time. Yes, 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 yes. Can't wait, I'm telling you. Uh, hearing no further announcements, let us continue to, with our call to worship in our bulletin. Here in this place, there are no foreigners, for all are welcome in God's house. Here in this worship, there is only acceptance, for the love is the language of faith. Here in our lives, there are no divisions, for God dwells in each of us. Come, let us worship him in unity and love. Now, if you'll turn to 87, his name is wonderful to begin our praise melody.
You may be seated. There's some good theology in that, that last hymn there. Well, good morning. morning. Thank you all for being out here. Uh, Let's get started with uh, some prayer. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for letting us come into this nice warm building to worship you and just prepare our hearts and minds to do so and um, help us to just enjoy this time. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let us now turn to our opening hymn, which is Be Still My Soul, and that's on 530. We're going to sing verses 1 and 2. Please stand. Inside your bulletins, you have a little slip that you can write your prayer requests on, and Drew is going to come around and collect them, and we'll pray over them. But while he does that, we're going to sing, we're going to sing Alleluia on 114, 1 and 3.
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this, this season. Uh, we just got past Christmas, and we thank you for all the time that we spent with our families and all that. Um, as we move out of that season, Lord, we're back into the trenches of, of every day. Um, and we face many of the same, same struggles. We have financial difficulties. We have health concerns. Uh, we have faith crises. We have all manner of, of different ailments. But Lord, we know that you being you and um, how good you are, that we can come to you boldly with these requests. And so, Lord, that's what I ask um, for you to do this morning is to listen to these requests. Um, and answer them according to your will. And Lord, please do this to to just show your your glory and to, to honor you. And we will wait expectantly. And we just thank you for everything that you do and are. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Good to see you all today. <clears throat> Do you have any children? Oh boy. <laughs> That's what I'm afraid of. Good morning. How many of you guys have ever made a promise? Did you ever break your promise? Did you? Was somebody pretty disappointed that you broke your promise? No. Huh? Did you ever break a promise? Was it bad? Do you still remember it? really well? Oh, no. Well, if I make you a promise, you expect me to keep it, don't you? Like, if I tell you that next Sunday I'll wear a tuxedo. Now, I didn't say I would. I said, if I said that, okay? <clears throat> or maybe I would make a promise to your dad and say something like, I'll wear my uniform. But I would never say that. God made us a promise. And God's promise is 100% bona fide, absolute, without any doubt, he will keep his promise. Jesus told us this when he said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But then he said something really cool. I go to prepare a place for you. Now, most of us here have never seen the mansion that God's building for us, have we? Have you seen it? Mm -mm, me either. When we moved to Plainfield, we were first going to live at a place down the road called Villas of Fox Run. And we saw a picture of what we were going to get, and we gave money to, to build what we were going to get, 
but we never got what we were going to get because they kept messing around and breaking their word to us as when they were going to attack us. So we went over to where we live now, Creekside Crossing, and we bought a place there. We saw the model, but we didn't get to see the house that we were getting. And the model we saw was exactly opposite. You know, the model, you went in this door, well, ours, you go in this door. In the model, the stairs were over here. In, the in ours, the stairs are over here. So it was exactly backwards. So we really weren't aware of what it was going to be. But the promise was they would have it ready for us to move in on Thanksgiving 2008. Well, guess what happened? Can anybody imagine what happened? Yes. We moved in. It was a miracle because men sometimes have a hard time keeping their promises. Men meaning all of us, not just guys. Right? But when we break a promise, what, what does that say? That, that says that we didn't keep our word, right? Well, God says, I'll make a promise to you. If you seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. Have you ever sought God with your whole heart? Have you ever said, Lord, I need you? Now, I know that there are times when you need God right away, right? When you need him in a hurry. And when I get in those kind of situations, I, I, don't, I don't pray like I normally do where I say, Oh, thou most high God, we loveth thee so greatly. Come and help us. When I get in those situations, I do this. God! Help me! Now, that doesn't give God any more reason to come than if I would have said, Oh, Lord, I need your help right now. Are you guys okay? Well, you're sitting behind the speakers. Think how it was out here. She should have known that. I've told this story a hundred times. But you see, it doesn't matter how loud we holler. What does it matter when we talk to God about? So we believe his promise. Do we have a relationship with him? When you ask mom for something, don't you realize that she gives you whatever she can, the best she can, when she can, because that's her promise to you to take care of you? Now, does she always give you the things that you want? Uh, wrong. Do you know what she does do? She and Dad, they love you so much that they sacrifice what they have to give you what you need. And that's what God did. God said, I love you so much, I want to have a relation. I want to know you personally. I want to be able to look at you and say, I know who that is. And so God said, I'll become one of you. And I'll show you how to live. That's what he did last week when we celebrated Christmas. I know we all celebrated gifts and wrapping paper and trees and lights and all those kind of things, and those are neat. But the real celebration was the promise that God made that he would send us a Savior, someone who will save us from our sins. Okay? Can you remember that? God's promise is 100% locked tight. Hmm? No, I thought I heard you say something. He spoke into my bad ear. <laughs> okay, you guys can go. Come forward, please, and we'll receive our morning offering.
stand. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Father, we ask your blessing upon these gifts, tithes, and offerings. And Lord, as we come to this last Sunday of the year, we pray, God, that the outpouring of your Spirit would, God, be greater than it was the first Sunday of the year. And Lord, that you would not only bless the service with your anointing, but God, you would bless these gifts, these tithes, these offerings. And God, above all, bless those who return unto you just a portion of what you've given. For God, you've given us more than just money. You've given us a life. You've given us friends, family, loved ones, and you've given us the best gift of all, that of Christ our Redeemer. We pray in his name, and everyone said, Amen. Please be seated. Thank you. Do what now? No, you don't. But today, the last day of the year, I wanted to do a sermon. Huh? For me, it's the last day of the year. Hey, she'll see it on a tape. Oh, I went... But I wanted, I wanted to do a recap of 2014. But having a pastor of a little advanced age, you guys are lucky. Everything's new to me. <laughs> so I, I can't go back and recap anything because it's all fresh and new every day. No, I'm just teasing. I've got a couple of things I want to share with you today. Exodus... Exodus chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I'm not eloquent, either in past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who's made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf? or seeing, or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with you. I will give you what to speak. I will teach you. But he said, O oh Lord, ah, I don't want to go. I didn't say it that way. He said, Oh my Lord, please send someone else. Please send someone else. 
Can you, can you get a, a, a picture of what Moses is really saying? Please send someone else. Moses was 80 years old. Man, that's 11 years from now for me. And I'm thinking to myself, at 80 years old, please, God, don't send me somewhere else. And I know you're all saying, God, please send him somewhere else. <laughs> but do you understand? Moses is 80 years old. His life is really quite complete. He's a dirty old shepherd on the back 40 of his father's-in-law's ranch, and he's tending sheep, he's got a wife and kids, and he's kind of set in his way. Not like any of us. None of us are set in our way, are we? And he said, well, this isn't too bad. I could get used to this. At 80 years old, he thinks he can get used to it. I guess he is, right? Been there 40 years. God had other plans for him. Moses became probably the most powerful person in all of biblical history except for Jesus Christ. But Moses had gotten, had Moses gotten his way, he would have probably died a simple sheep herder on the back of Mount Horeb. Moses thought that the dream of delivering his people was dead. Have you ever had, how many of you have got a dream that's died? Y'all got a dream that's died? I do. I had a dream of being the regent of Oral Roberts University. <laughs> now, that's really a nightmare. But that was a dream of mine. I had a dream of being a famous musician. I had a dream of being a great televangelist. I had all them dreams. And they all die. But the one dream that I have that's never gone away is the dream to lead people to know Jesus Christ. Whether that's on a scale of thousands or that's one or two of the kids here that go, I, I understand. Or maybe... Or maybe, just maybe, one of you, that all of a sudden, something that's said, something that's, that's preached about, all of a sudden goes click, and you go, I know, I know, there's no doubt about it. He's real in my heart, and I'm going to shout it. See, he told God to send someone else, but God would not take no for an answer. If I had gotten my way, I would have not been here preaching today. If I'd have had my way, I'd have probably been dead by now. Hmm. Yeah. How many of you here today got what you wanted for Christmas? Wow, that's great. That's wonderful. Let me share a story I found with you. I want, I want, I want. Those words scream through my aching head like fingernails on a chalkboard as a four-year-old in front of me kept saying, Mommy, I want this, Mommy, I want this, Mommy, 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 I want this, I want this. Laying on the floor, throwing a fit. Mommy, I want this, Mommy, I want this, Mommy, I want this, oh, Mommy, I want this. Ever had that happen? Hmm? One of the things that this story reminds me of is my prayer list. I'd wanted a lot of things. This lady goes on and she writes. I'd wanted a lot of things. I wanted my husband to have more joy and less stress at his job. I wanted my mother-in-law and sister-in-law to be healed of disease. I wanted my son and daughter-in-law conceive a child they so desperately desired, and then I wanted my mother, my best friend, to be given a clear, all clear, 
on her scan for cancer. While some of my wants came to fruition, others lay lifeless on a shelf. Prayers containing my wants seemed like nothing more than that little four-year-old screaming on the floor. They were heavy, going up, like trying to throw a bowling ball through the ceiling. Another year, another Christmas, my heart was heavy laden with disappointment. My sister-in-law and mother-in-law passed away within 10 days of each other. My mother was given the news that she'd have to undergo chemotherapy again. It's enough to get this kind of news during the year, but why during the holidays? Feeling alone and unheard, I struggled with the W word, not the want, but the why. Why then? Why death? Why sickness? Why now? My soul shuddered at the disappointment. If you remember the little story that I told the kids, This lady says, I've been a Christian since I was six years old. I'm in the ministry. I tell people to have faith. I thought to myself, what in the world is wrong with you? I have no idea what to do with all the fear and uncertainty rolling around inside of me. But I was determined to get a grip on it all. After all, that's what control freaks do. We get a hold of it, we hang on to it, we make it work, right? Don't we do that? I'm guilty. I don't know about you, but I'm guilty. She said, I have a favorite place to go. It's by the sea. No one knows about it. I grabbed my coat and took off and went to, upon arrival, I found my favorite spot tucked away under the tall grass, a great spot. Have you ever had a place like that? As I prayed, I poured out my heart to God with my patterned prayer. Unfortunately, it's one we all know well, too well. It starts out with these words, God, I want just like the kid in the store. I was doing the same thing. As I rambled through the list, just like the kid sitting on Santa's lap, I was stopped cold in my tracks by a voice. Shannon, it said, why don't you stop and thank me for what you already have? I knew it was God, I knew it was real, and I knew I had better listen. A war ensued inside of me. Have you ever had that war go on inside of you? I trust you, God, I want it my way. I trust you, God, I'll do it my way. God, I want it, I want, I want it. Although my arguments were scriptural, my heart was selfish. I didn't want to do things God's way. Moses on the back of the South 40 of his dad's property. I wanted things my way. I wanted my mom free of cancer. I wanted my son and wife to have a baby. I wanted my sister back. I wanted my brother back. I wanted everything the way I wanted it. At first, my heart was stubborn. I didn't want to thank God. I actually was mad at God. Mad that he hadn't done things my way. Mad that people I loved had left this world. Mad that it was Christmas and I wasn't going to get my Christmas miracle. I heard the voice again. It's okay. I can handle your disappointment. I can handle your anger. But thank me anyway. The Apostle Paul wrote to us and he said, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. 
Hmm. With tears running down my face, I began thanking God for everything he was doing in the middle of my wants. Instead of asking God for my mom to be healed, I thank God for the time that I've had with my mother. Rather than asking God to remove my husband's stress, I thank God that my husband had a job. For the next two hours at the pond, I did nothing but thank God. Year in review, seen some pretty terrible things take place in our church. Passing the van. And I, I did what you've probably done. I sat and cried and asked why. I think back to the first year I was here. I met a, an incredible man with an incredible sense of humor named Howard Saar. And Howard had a real unique way of things. I think of Marge Parks. I think of the people who've made such an impact, and I ask why. But then I hear the voice that was spoke, speaking to this lady at the pond. Be grateful for the time that you've had. Be grateful. I thanked him that I had another day. I thanked him that my husband was able to work. I did nothing but thank God. Now my Christmas want look, list looks different. There's only one thing on my list. No presents. But only his presence is what I desire. John 4.23 reminds us, but the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And the Father seeks such to worship him. Can you stumble and fall? I want to tell you what the scripture says. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. I want you to notice something in that scripture. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delights in his way. It doesn't say if he falls. It says when he falls. He shall not utterly be cast down. I have this picture in my head of 2015. Now, I know you all think I'm, I'm crazy, but that's okay. I, I, I have this picture of 2015, and it's, and it's of a father and son walking down the road. And the son's a wee little tyke, and he reaches up and he takes his father's finger. You know how we kids used to do, or I know how my kids used to do, take my finger, and that was holding my hand. They, this picture I have is this son and father, and the son reaches up and takes his father's finger and holds it, and they're walking down the road. And the boy slips and falls. Well, the father doesn't have a hold of the boy. The boy has a hold of the father, and guess what? The boy falls and skins his knee. So a couple days later, they're walking down the, the same road, the same path, and the father now takes the hand of the little boy, and he's holding the hand. And the little boy's walking down the path, 
and he stumbles and falls again. Silly little kid, why didn't you get on the other side? I know, that's what you're all thinking. But here, Father now has a hold of the son's hand, and guess what? The son doesn't fall and skin his knee because the Father, the Father, God, the Father, has a hold of us. Though he stumble, he shall not fall. Why? Because the Father has a hold of my hand. You see, when we trust God, we're not holding on to God. God's holding on to us. The, the story goes, I took Kelly a walk one time when we were still living in Ohio. We had a place called Campaign Creek. And Campaign Creek was an old strip mine creek, and it was really kind of cold water. It was an artesian well that fed it, so you can imagine how cold it was. And we were going across, crossing the creek on the rocks. And Kelly kept trying to get my hand away from hers, but I had a hold of her hand. And she's doing this. We got about halfway across the creek on walking on the stones, and she slipped. And I walked across the creek like this with her, and she says, Wow, thanks, Dad. Though you stumble, you will not fall. Why? Because you put your hand in the hand of the man that calmed the sea. That'd make a good song, wouldn't it? Put your hand on. God ordains every step we take. So you're saying that everything's predestined. No. God promises that when we fall, we will not be utterly destroyed. That's what that scripture means. When we fall, not if we fall, not should we fall. But when we fall, we will fall. We will get mad. We will get upset. We will scream and holler because God didn't do it our way. We learn that strong people sometimes do very stupid things. Saints often act like sinners. Have you ever had a temper tantrum as a Christian? Enough said. Jonah threw a temper tantrum. Noah, when he got off the ark, God saved Noah and his family only. Guess what? He went out and did stupid stuff. He got naked. Drunk and naked. Embarrassed his sons. Peter. Peter, the strongest apostle that there was. Right? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, Peter, but my Father in heaven. Peter knew who Jesus was, and just two short days later, what did Peter say? I don't know him. Well, you must have me confused with somebody else. Why did he say that? How did they know he was with Jesus? Because he had the same accent Jesus had. See, Jesus was from the south. And all of them Pharisees could tell, couldn't they, Christy? All of them Pharisees could figure out but he says, no, it wasn't me. You've got me confused with somebody else. <laughs> Strong people do stupid stuff. Stupid stuff. 
Every detail of your life is under God's control. Then why doesn't he do it this way? Right, Billy? Every, one, every person sitting in here has had that conversation with God. Every one of you. Why did mom die? Why did my brother die? Why did my dad have to die? Why did her mom and dad die? Let me share something with you. God takes pleasure. This is going to freak you out. God takes pleasure in your struggle to walk in holiness. You know why? Because he knows you can't do it on your own. I'm going to tell you the hardest person in the world to bring to Jesus Christ is a strong-willed, strong-backed, strong-natured person because we don't need help. May I tell you something? When God finally takes that strong-willed person and snaps it like a twig, then we become like Peter, who says, though everybody else denies you, I will not because I've got what it takes. David wrote to us, he says, when you fall, you will not utterly be destroyed. God wants us to walk in holiness. God designs our trials so that they will not destroy us, but will cause us to grow more trusting in him. I know some of you don't believe that, but that's okay. Let me tell you what Jesus said to Simon Peter the rock. Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to sift thee like wheat. Listen to the next line. But I have prayed for you. Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. He predicted the failure of Peter. And he says, but when you turn back, strengthen. They weren't half as strong as Peter. He knew Peter better than Peter knew Peter. He knew the steps that Peter was about to take, the wrong direction. You say, if he's God, then why didn't he just stop it? Why didn't he just put his hand out and say, don't go that way? Why didn't he just heal? Why didn't he just fix? Why didn't he just take? Because to get you where you are today took everything that was in the past to get you here now. I know that doesn't make a lot of sense to pragmatic people, but it's the truth. Jesus knew about the boasting, teenage girl that would tell him who he was, the swearing, the repeated denials, the shame, the bitter tears, the guilt. But he also knew about this word in Peter's life, restoration. That's what he knew. That's what he knew. We will not utterly fail because God will not let go of us. I'm going to share something with you. On Monday, December the 22nd, I had a burden on my heart. I sat in my office for an hour and a half and cried over this.
for people who feel that so much of their time has been wasted, their life has been poured out for nothing. Years and decades have gone past without the manifestation of God's promises in some long-awaited area and the glorious joy of a breakthrough. I sense that the Lord was saying that nothing is lost. I'll say that again. I sense the Lord saying to me, tell them, nothing is lost. No time has really been lost because God is now redeeming the time that has felt like it was lost. 2015 is going to seem as a year of great restoration. More than before, will explode into the lives of his people as they wait on him. The years of pain, anguish, despair, hopelessness, disappointment, waiting, he is going to make up for more than ever in 2015. More will be done in his redemption and restoration in 2015 than has been done in the past 10 years. Many who felt the best years of their life are over are about to move into the best years of their lives as they wait on and delight in the Lord. the greatest demonstration of a turnaround and restoration are about to be seen. Inheritance lost will be doubled, hearts broken will be mended, made whole and filled with joy and peace more than ever before. Promises for restoration of broken lives, broken homes from decades of hurt will be healed. Financial ruin through the enemy's stealing will be turned around and we'll see God restore in abundance. And these ones will, will be some of the most generous givers that we've ever seen. Many who feel their time has been stolen to do things they want to do in life will be given the blessings and the grace to do all on their heart and more. The people of God are stepping into the greatest seasons where the banner will be raised over them that declares restored, restored. We are being restored. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, Take this word and restore unto the people that which has been stolen. Father, your word tells us that when the thief is found out, he must restore seven times what he took. God, I'm standing upon your promise. And I just taught our little children here today that your promises are 100%. So God, today, we ask that your will, according to your promise and word, be done. And we stand upon that promise and ask your blessing upon this congregation. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me, please, as we sing our closing hymn, I Have Decided. Turn. 
Father, make your face shine upon us and grant us your peace. Dismiss us from this place, Father, but never from your presence. And may the power of the Holy Spirit bring us into the expectation of 2015 being a great year of restoration. Restore unto us, Father, the joy of our salvation, first of all. Restore unto us, Father, that which the canker worm has taken away. And God, may we be able to look at the beginning of 2016, back at 2015, and declare it was truly anything but a routine year. May it be filled with your presence and your direction. For we ask it in Christ's name, and everyone said.